Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Because you know what I found out? If somebody is determined not to be happy, there is no way that anybody can make them happy. This is a decision that we have to make. I will not spend my life miserable. A great prophet of God, one of the mightiest men of God in the Bible, who got into a fit of self-pity. So it can happen to anybody, no matter how godly they are, and we'll see how God dealt with him. Now, Elijah was a, just one of the greatest prophets ever, walked in tremendous power. Going into chapter 19, he had just killed 400 of Jezebel's false prophets and just, I mean, had an amazing, victorious day, just tremendous day. And in chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and now he had slain all the prophets of Baal with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she basically sent out a message. I know what you've done. Now hear this. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do to you what you did to them. And verse 3 says, and he was afraid. Now why would this man who had just seen fire come down from heaven <laughs> be afraid of one woman? <laughs> yeah, well, that's another whole message. We won't go there. But... You know what they say, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> Part of it was because he was tired. He'd had a huge day of ministry. If you actually study what the Bible says, it says that he single-handedly cut all these 400 prophets into pieces. Now, I cannot imagine what kind of energy that would take, but that would be a pretty big job. I mean, just, I, I can't even imagine. He had a great prayer day and called fire. I mean, it was just amazing. Praise God. Ah, that's awesome. Ah, praise God. You know, it's kind of like I am after these conferences. I mean, I'm done. I got just fired. Like, that was great. Hallelujah. Praise God. 800 people got saved. Awesome. People's lives were changed. And then... I mean, they can tell you the people who were with me today. I was just like, oh, that was just, wow. Yeah. Felt like I'd never need to sleep again in my whole life. <laughs> and after I went and ate some macaroni and cheese somewhere, <laughs> which I normally don't eat, but I wanted to pamper myself. I told you this morning we had to go get something for our flesh, didn't I? After I beat up on you. And then I, and I went back to my hotel room and I thought, how can anybody be this tired? <laughs> can I possibly go back there tonight and do it again? I don't know. Two hours of sleep and quiet and rest, and here I am again. Well, Elijah was tired. Can I tell you something? A lot of your problems, and I'm serious, a lot of your problems would be solved if you would sleep and rest and do something to make you laugh a lot more often? <laughs> we need to laugh, amen? I went out with a couple of my kids last week and we laughed so hard all day. And it is wonderful what a good hard laugh. Wow, sister, there ain't nothing funny in my life. Well, <laughs> then just stay under the bus. Because you know what I found out? If somebody is determined not to be happy, there is no way that anybody can make them happy. This is a decision that we have to make. I will not spend my life miserable. Can anybody make that decision for yourself tonight? I will not spend my life miserable.
So now this great prophet of God is running from one woman after having killed 450 prophets the day before. And he arose, verse 3, and he went for his life and he came to Beersheba of Judah over 80 miles. I guess he couldn't have been in too bad a shape if he ran 80 miles, I don't know. <laughs> and out of Jezebel's realm, and I love this, but he left his servant behind. Now, you know, if you're getting ready for a pity party, you don't want nobody with you. This is one party you don't invite anybody else to. I'm going to teach you now how to plan a pity party. <laughs> and he went a day's journey into the wilderness. If you're going to have a pity party, you need to be in a pitiful place. <laughs> and he came and he sat down under one lone broom or juniper tree. Just one, don't want too many. Might look pretty. Find a lonely looking tree with not too many leaves and sit down under it by yourself and look at all the sand. And he said, oh God, that I might die. <laughs> Oh, Lord, it's enough now. Oh, Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay asleep under the tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. You know, it, if you're going to have a pity party, you've got to plan your food or the lack thereof. <laughs> I personally, when I'm having a pity party, I don't eat. I don't, I kind of like the starving thing, you know, like, well, I just guess I just won't even eat. <laughs> but some people want to eat. Now, the angel brought Elijah cake, so I guess cake is a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> he looked, and behold, verse 6, there was a cake baked on the coals and a bottle of water at his head, and he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Now, you know, there's some really good messages here. I mean, really, what Elijah needed, he had gotten in this condition because he needed some sleep and a couple of good meals. But he's persistent on feeling sorry for himself. So then he came to a cave, and he went in the cave. You know, a cave's a nice dark place, too, and be miserable. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and I love this. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, well, I've been jealous for you, God, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and now watch it, and I only am left. I'm the only one, God, that still loves you. <laughs> Come on, you know how it sounds. I'm the only Christian in my family, God, and I just, it's just too hard on me. I'm the only believer where I work, God. you got to get me out of this awful place. <laughs> oh, I thought you were the one that prayed that God would use you. <laughs> oh, no, I guess that was somebody else. Okay. And so God said to him, verse 11, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the right. I mean, the Lord just tearing up stuff, you know, and so you would think that would have straightened him out, but verse 12 says, and after the earthquake of fire, and but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, the sound of a gentle stop, a gentle, still, small voice. When Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. There came a voice the second time saying, what are you doing here? <laughs> now, come on, I, I think God is wanting to say to some people tonight, maybe some here, maybe some watching by TV, what are you doing with your life? Why are you wasting your days in depression or feeling sorry for yourself or being mad at somebody that's out having a good time and don't even care that you're upset? Why are you wasting your life moaning over something that you can never get back in your life, but you could let go of it and press on to the things that are ahead. What are you doing here? <laughs> 
Good, we got about four people up here on the front row that like this. <laughs> I'm kidding. Verse 14, and he said, see, same thing. He's got the same thing. Oh, Lord, I've been very jealous for you because the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars. Same old song. We need to sing a new song. I'm the only one left. And after going through this over and over, in verse 15, you see that God just tells him, get back to work. <laughs> Go anoint this king and anoint that king. And by the way, while you're at it, anoint Elisha to be a prophet in your place. Ooh, I'm about to get replaced. Better straighten up. <laughs> when I used to get into these self-pity fits, I always had my party. My party always ended up in the bathroom for some reason. I don't know why in particular, but I'd mope around the house and feel sorry for myself because Dave was watching football. <laughs> the kids were out playing and everybody enjoyed their life but me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Have I got any relatives out here tonight? Everybody, man, I just, I work all week cleaning this place up. You guys come home on the weekend. You just lay over there and watch football games and play golf and the kids play. And who cares? Who cares about me? Nobody cares about me. What about me? What about me? Nobody cares about me. Oh. I was trying to stay away from the what about me statement. Maybe later, maybe at the end, maybe tomorrow, I don't know. And I would always, when I started feeling sorry for myself, I would work loudly. <laughs> Come on, do, we, do I have any women here? No, you work, see? Loud, you slam doors and drawers, you vacuum in front of everybody. And when I was finally at the point of being ready to weep now, I would go to the very back bathroom in the back of the house. Get in the floor, hug the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I was already teaching the Word by then. <laughs> Still in my living room floor with my 25 people that I had for five years. <laughs> One time I heard the Lord say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> and one time I was doing this, I was like seven months pregnant with my last child. Down on the floor, crying my head off. What do you think you're doing? You know how ridiculous you look? <laughs> Why do women cry in the bathroom? Because when we're done, running, the eyes are red, they're bloodshot, you look so bad. You got your hair going in four directions now. And, you can... and then I would do this, I would go back through the house where Dave was. and be a woman of power. You can't have power in the pulpit and be pitiful at home. Amen. 
And I actually remember this happening. Honey, if you're going to the kitchen, could you bring me an iced tea? You know, there's nothing that makes you madder as a woman than when you're trying to get attention. <laughs> and you know what I wanted? I wanted to hear one thing. Honey, is anything wrong? <laughs> and then when he would finally say, I'd say, no, what makes you think something's wrong? <laughs> Come on, we all need a little time on the psychiatrist's couch, and I'm being the psychiatrist tonight. Now, we hauled that thing all the way from St. Louis just for you to see that. <laughs> Pity is always accompanied by negative thoughts. Always. It's always about what you don't have, what people are not doing. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about two twins. Two twins were alike in every way except one was an optimist and the other was a pessimist. I mean, they looked alike, they were the same height, everything, but one was very negative, one was very positive. The parents got concerned about them, took them to the doctor who suggested a test. He said, for their birthday this year, give the pessimist the best racing bicycle money can buy and give the optimist a box of manure. <laughs> when the day finally came, the pessimist was led to his new box, new bike, he looked at it and said, oh, I'll probably crash and break my leg. <laughs> the optimist opened his box of manure and after a momentary shock, got excited, jumped up, ran outside. He said, you can't fool me. Where there's this much manure, there's got to be a pony somewhere. You know what I wrote down here? Learning to think positively in a negative situation is one of the best things that you can ever do for yourself. I thought, you know what, that's good. I'm gonna turn that into a Facebook post. You don't have to wait to feel like thinking positive. You can think what you want to. You can do it on purpose. All reason for hope being gone, Abraham hoped on in faith because he decided to. David said, what, what would have become of me had I not believed to see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Some people are what we call injustice collectors. <laughs> They're people who collect and keep memories of every injustice that's ever been done to them in their whole life. feel sorry for themselves, they collect every memory of how they've been mistreated and what people have not done for them and about all their hardships and how much time they've spent under the bus. And they look for people that will sympathize with them and if they can't find anybody, they're very happy to feel sorry for themselves. But can I tell you something, no matter how mistreated you may have been and no matter how unfair it might be, you can never get justice for yourself. Doesn't do you any good to try to take revenge on the people that hurt you, because when you do that, you just keep hurting yourself more and more. But God is a God of justice. And God will bring justice in our lives. This afternoon, I sat in my chair and I looked up, I went to the concordance and looked up the word reward. And I just looked up a lot of scriptures about how God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when he comes, he will bring his reward with him. And God rewards those who are faithful and who wait on him. And I tell you, if you've been hurt in your life, which most of us have been, and you have put your trust and confidence in God, and you are waiting on him, you're not bitter, you're not resentful, you're not mean, you're not taking it out on other people, you're not sitting around feeling sorry for yourself, you have got a reward coming. Payday is coming. Amen? Amen. But remember, you cannot be pitiful and powerful. It just will not work. Am I preaching to myself tonight, or is this for anybody in the house? 
How about if we become blessing collectors instead of injustice collectors? Why don't you start keeping a notebook of your blessings, special little things that happen, things that God does for you, prayers that he answers. And man, when you're tempted to have one of those pity parties, go get that book out. Have a talk with yourself. David talked to himself when depression was coming on King David. He said, why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. In other words, I have to say sometimes, okay, Joyce, stop it. We're not gonna go there today. Not today. <laughs> Count your blessings. You're breathing, aren't you? You probably drove a car here, or at least you rode in one. You've come with someone, so that means at least one person in the world cares about you. <laughs> you will go home tonight, perhaps have a snack, slip into a nice comfy bed. You're probably born again, and if not, you can be before you leave out the doors tonight. That means you're on your way to heaven. Good news, you're not going to hell. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming soon. And you know, I was thinking today about some of the spiritual blessings that I have in my life. You know, after being abused and mistreated by my mom and dad, and having so many hurtful things in my life, I can stand here tonight and say, I'm not mad at anybody and I'm not bitter. That's a blessing. And not only that, God is allowing me to take what happened to me and use it to actually help other people. If you're a self-pity addict, why don't you just go on a short-term missions trip? You'll get over it real quick. Or if you can't do that, Drive into the inner city somewhere where people don't have hardly anything and just drive around for five or 10 minutes. You'll get over it. The best treatment in the world for sadness is to help somebody else. Matter of fact, I wrote this down. When the love of God that's in us begins to flow out of us, it heals everything in between. Let me tell you a little story about a little guy named Chad. He was a shy, quiet little fellow, and for some reason, just one of those kids that just always got ignored and passed over, and so he spent most of his time alone, didn't have hardly anybody to play with, and most of the kids at school ignored him. And he came home from school one day, and it was getting close to Valentine's Day, and he said, Mom, I want to make everybody in the class a Valentine." And her heart sank. And she thought, I just wish that he wouldn't do that. Because she'd watched the children when they walked home with him. He was always behind the rest of them and they laughed and played and hung on to each other while he walked alone. Chad never got included in much of anything. Nevertheless, she decided to go along with her son's request and so she purchased the paper, the glue and the crayons for three whole weeks, night after night, Chad painstakingly made 35 Valentines. While well, Valentine's Day dawned and Chad was beside himself with excitement, he carefully stacked them all up, put them into a bag, bolted out the door. His mom decided that she would bake his favorite cookies and have cookies and milk ready for him when he came home from school because she was pretty sure he'd come in disappointed. She knew that he wouldn't get any Valentines, not even one. It hurt her to think that he might not get even one. That afternoon, she had the cookies and the milk on the table. When she heard the children outside, she looked out the window, and sure enough, they were all laughing. But Chad was pulling up the rear again, nobody talking to him. He walked a little faster than usual, and she thought he was so hurt, he was just hurrying to get in the house. She expected him to burst into the door in tears. He got inside, his arms were empty. She noticed that when the door opened, he, she choked back tears. Son, I've got some warm cookies and milk for you. But he hardly heard her words. He just marched right past her and his face seemed to be glowing and all he could say was, not a one, not a one. And she thought, I knew it. He didn't even get one. And he said, Mom, 
I didn't forget one. I gave every kid a Valentine. I didn't forget even one. <laughs> Chad wasn't worried about not having received any. Instead, he was proud that he didn't forget to give one child a Valentine. No pity party for little Chad. Boy, if we could just live like that, wouldn't it be amazing? You know, anybody can feel sorry for themselves, but nobody has to. <laughs> Eh, lo hacía escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba cómo a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener la familia como en secreto, esas cosas. Que, no, que era fea, que, no, que nadie me pescaba que no había esperanza en mí, que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme. Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step-by-step -step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they're reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Humana, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, del abrazo familiar, del abrazo de alguien que te ama, lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumento de Dios. Y esta es mi familia. Ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que Él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. What do you see now? When I'm working, many people come to me and say, Oh, your smile, you have something special. A ver que you say, special. And one time I stopped and looked at the mirror, but I looked at my eyes. And he said, I did this. It was my face. What an amazing privilege 
to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman, it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty. And you can do that with us right here in Chile as we've been talking about and in many, many places all over the world. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Do you think that your thoughts are random and meaningless? Or do they affect you more than you realize? Well, God's Word teaches us the importance of our thoughts. In Strijd in je Denken legt Joyce uit waarom letterlijk alles in ons leven samenhangt met ons denken. Actually, everything in life begins with a thought, even the changes that you might be looking for. Deze bestseller, met een oplage van ruim 6 miljoen exemplaren, heeft het leven van veel mensen al veranderd. Bestel Strijd in je Denken door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joyce-meyer.nl slash strijd.